Yo, guys, what's going on? I am appreciate y'all. I'm very appreciative of y'all tuning in for this first debut podcast of Lush Louisville. You know, peep the uh, UK, go Cats. Uh, you know, what's the, <laughs> the mask? <laughs> I'm like, I don't even know what I'm saying. But I appreciate y'all tuning in. So this podcast is, uh, you know, specifically uh, uh, based around me interviewing different uh, creatives all around Louisville. People that I know and some people that I don't know. But my very first guest today on the debut show, one of my good friends and a very uh, longtime friend and very one of probably one of the most creative and talented people that I've ever been around. Funny, funny as hell. You already know people who know him. You already know. And uh, yeah, so that's the basis of the show. And uh, it's going to be a weekly thing. And again, I apologize for the uh, technical difficulties that we were having earlier. We uh, still learning some things, but that's you know, that's just how it goes. So uh yeah, guys, without further ado, let me introduce to you Jerron Hurst. Get on in here, buddy. <laughs> you already know. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jeff. What's you going doing on? all right? Good to see you. Yeah, I'm doing good. Social distancing? Yeah, so social distancing? yeah, I was going to say, what mm-hmm. you doing about that? Yeah, take that a message. shot real quick. <laughs> but now, um, how you been doing, Kevin? You been all right? Man, I've been good. Just enduring this quarantine, you know. Can't, can't fucking breathe with this mask on, but you know, it's know, okay. It's, it's a little uncomfortable with my, yeah, headphones. Keep, my headphones keep pulling it below my nose. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and join it to your live real quick too. Yeah, let me add you in. So we on. What's up, Marshall? What's up, Jake? Let me. Uh, what's going on here? I'm trying to see some live. It says I'm supposed to do live. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go ahead and set this on yours real quick. What is this? It's YouTube. Oh, so it's gonna be an echo the entire time. That's a little weak. Actually, if you're in, (laughs) what's going on with this stream? You see me over here, and you can see me over here, and you can see me over there, and you can see me over here, and you can see me over there. All right, here goes. Here goes the live stream. Yeah. All right, there we go. All right, bet. So let's get in these comments here. If you're on uh, streaming live here, where? Let's see. Where do I even see these comments? (laughs) <laughs> There's so much to learn here. Uh, oh, there should be a way that I can. Wow, actual oh, beer. You know, you know, it's a little something, something. You know, we try to do as hard as we can. Yeah, you know? absolutely. I try to not get too drunk during the day, but you know, I'm an alcoholic, so it's whatever. This is a special day. Every day is a special day to me, Kevin. I live life on the edge. I'm not gonna lie to you. I can't do this. I can't breathe. <laughs> if you get Corona, I'm sorry, but I just can't fucking there we breathe. Go. All right, so we got Jerron's Instagram up on the YouTube live. If if anybody's seen, yeah, here, what's the echo coming from? Uh, it's definitely coming from them, us both recording at the same time. If you want me to get off live, I can. No, 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 no. Just just turn it down. Turn yours down a little bit. I turned it down as low as I possibly could. You did? Yeah. That's, um, all right, that's probably better now. Yo, what's up, Holly? How you doing? It's all right. You're just gonna hear a slight echo. Just ignore it. Unless you want me to get off. Well, because it's probably going to be in the stream. Okay, actually, yeah, you're right. I'm going to go ahead and get off there. I'm going to just get off. I appreciate it. But you're still in my life. Yeah, no, for sure, so. for sure. I'm going to get off. The, All right, uh, excuse us, everybody. We're, uh, we're new to this. All right, so, All right, uh, Jerron, tell us about yourself, man. Where where, where are you from? What's your what's your background story here? What are we, what are we dealing with? Okay, so for the people that don't know, a lot of people think I'm from J-Town for some reason. I want to just clarify, no, I am not, Okay. Um, I'm from Beach Terrace. I grew up in the projects, and then uh, after that, I probably kind of spread all over all over the place. I've been around a bunch of whites. I've been around a bunch of blacks, but uh, ultimately, uh, I've been all over the place. But uh, I am from the hood, so don't try me. <laughs> there don't you have it. Jerron is from the hood. Jerron is from the hood. What about you, Kevin? Where are your whereabouts? Man, I was born here, right here in Louisville, Kentucky, about... <laughs> in, this, in this exact house? Yeah, no, no, actually, it was like five minutes from here. Okay. And, uh, yeah, well, I was born in uh, Norton Healthcare downtown, mm-hmm. and then they took me to the house. <laughs> and then from there, yeah, now I'm here. But, uh, so, growing up in Louisville, Jerron, what do you, where, where were you hanging out mostly? Where, where'd you go to school? What was your... Okay, I was mostly uh, a West End baby, if I were to say so myself. I spent most of my time out in the West End or out in Shively. And so, um, school-wise, um, 
I went to multiple different elementary schools just because he moved a lot. Uh, middle school, though, I went to Farnsley, and then for high school, I went to Manuel High School. And so, um, I mean, it was smooth. I liked Manuel. It was a lot of pricks there, but there were also a lot of Kevins there, too. There were some cool guys and whatnot. That's actually Kevins. where me and Kevin met, for you all that don't know. Yes, yes. But, um... I got a story about that. Yeah, okay, so you go and tell that story now if you're ready. I remember... It's it, it's not an eventful story at all now that I think about it, but mm. you were in my homeroom class because you were all every all four years because your last name is H mm-hmm. and mine's a J. Yeah. And uh, you came, it was the first day of freshman year and you came in and we're sitting in the back and uh, yeah, this is really not an eventful story at all, but that's just the first. And I remember looking back and you were sitting at a table by yourself because I, there was. Just you know what no, it was? Nobody I, didn't fuck, had, I didn't fuck with people. I, I, nobody. I, let me clarify this, okay? Because people said that I was intimidating as fuck in high school and that I was a real, like, loner up, and Chris? I didn't really, you know, talk to people that much or whatnot. Truthfully, what it was is um, I just realized that, uh, I don't know, I was just different and, like, a lot of y'all was just um, weird. <laughs> y'all were either weird or y'all were just too fucking smart. You know what I mean? Like, That's true. I hated those Asian kids at school. They just think they just fucking knew everything. Well, a lot of them so did. So I talk to them. I don't know. It was a little weird environment there. So I had to get accustomed to I had to get acclimated before I just started talking to everyone there. That was truthfully what it was. Yeah, it, it was, um, dude, that was, it's crazy. That was like almost nine years ago. <laughs> Nine I want to tell I want to tell y'all one of my favorite memories of Kevin. My funniest memory I have of Kevin is one day my senior year of high school we were going to the Mel Omega football game and around this time I had probably smoked weed maybe three or four times in my life and Kevin decided he was like you know what Jerron we are actually gonna smoke and <laughs> we went to Steak and Shake afterwards. That was the funniest part. We went to Steak and Shake afterwards with two of our friends. And at Steak and Shake, this man Kevin laughed for 15 minutes straight without saying a single word. <laughs> that is the funniest memory I will ever have of Kevin in my life. That is hilarious. Yep, well, you know. But, uh, yeah, so uh, I do remember that, though. But um, what was I going to say? about? I remember you telling me mm-hmm. about <laughs> the first time that I told you that I played basketball. And then a few years later, you were telling me when I told you that, you were like, yo, man, when I, Kevin, when you first told me that, you were like, I just looked at you and I was like, man, I was smashed <laughs> in basketball. He's like, you just don't, you don't give off that basketball I know, look. I know. You don't give off that, I'm going to give you a bucket look. <laughs> and so I was like, boy, like, what That's do you my mean? Euro. You don't want my Euro. Stuff. But you definitely, you definitely can play basketball. I definitely learned, I definitely learned that in PE. Yeah. No, that was, uh, good times, Emmanuel. Good times, Emmanuel. Shout out to everybody who, we ain't got anybody on the live right now. No, that's we all right. We ain't got nobody in our chat that's right all right. now. They're going to they gonna see it. Yeah, they're they going to see it. But, yeah, shout out to everybody who went to Manual. It's been a minute. We got to, you know, you going to that reunion? How long is that? Because <laughs> I feel like I, I haven't have got no my shit idea. together yet. I it's have like, no idea. If it's a 10-year reunion, what are we like? We're on like years. We're halfway there. No, I, it, I think it's a five-year thing. It's definitely not 10 years. I'm not high and I, it's gonna have to be ten years for me. No, if it's a five year reunion, I'm not going. I can't go there. Urban just be shit, shit talking uh, everybody. Uh, who's dude, there. I didn't even think of that. It just Urban and Eli just it, shit it, on everybody who's dude, there. Dude, he, dude, I heard Eli's been. Uh, Yo, he's living it up. For he's, he's living his best life. Modeling for rap. He's living his absolute. He's modeling best for life. rap Simmons. Very proud of him. But yeah, no. And then the people say, "Well, yeah, draw. What are you doing? Making funny money? Making <laughs> jokes?" You are though. I saw you flexing in after your the second show I went to. All that money you had collected from the show. Oh yeah, I definitely, I definitely try to get paid a ticket now as much as I possibly can. But um, no, like they're doing, they're doing very well for themselves. I'm very, I'm very proud of them and whatnot. I think you finally have your first comment. Oh yes, <laughs> my first comment. My buddy Mitch, what's going on? This kid, he uh, went to school with me at Middle Tennessee. He he moved, lives in Boca Raton, Florida now. Boca Raton. Let's get in here. What, what what's going on, Mitch? What you doing? Oh my! He said, "Where's Kevin James coming in?" He did that on purpose. <laughs> it's with an N. But uh, yeah. So what what what's um what are some of your focuses right? Now? First of all, how are you? Okay, tell us about your the different. I mean, you're you're talented in different ways, and you're you're you kind of like dabble in different mm-hmm. creative things. Like, tell us about what what what's your Where'd you start, and what did you start doing? Okay, for me, um, I had always been drawing whenever I was growing up. I was always an artist and whatnot, but um, 
and for people who aren't into astrology, I'm going to tell you a little, something quick just because I've learned a lot myself recently here. Uh, I'm a Gemini, and most Geminis, and most Geminis, they like to dabble in a lot of different things at the same time. They're very curious, you know what I mean? They're very adaptable. And so, uh, for me, I like to experiment in all forms of art. I think I'm like I can do proficient work in all forms of art. Like I'm a very good cook, and then I'm also uh, an artist. And then like I, I make music, and now I do stand up comedy. And before I was producing music as well. And so. Um, Truthfully to me, it's like, I just like to express myself any way I can with any form of art. I think art is a great way to understand who you are as a person and a great way to like show others who you are as a person as well. You know what I mean? Like even mm -hmm. writing, I like writing a lot as well. And so, uh, yeah, for me, um, really it's about whatever gets some bitches, you know, whatever gets them in, the, in, in, in my phone, whatever helps them come my way. But is that really what you do? No. <laughs> okay. All right. Not in the slightest. No, it's really just a form of expression, man. Like I, I look at painting as like a way of like therapy for myself, like a lot of my paintings, like I paint a lot of portraits that are about myself and whatnot, and like about how I feel. Just to have a great understanding of how it is that I feel whenever I don't really know how I feel. You know what I mean? And then with like music and whatnot, I think it's a great way for me to like um, tell my own individual story while also relating to others around me. You know what I mean? Because a lot of people go through the same shit that I go through. And then yeah. with like cooking, I mean, I just like to appeal to the senses and I love some great food. And I remember growing up, I used to watch the Food Network channel all the time, and that was like porn to me. <laughs> and so. No, yeah. that show it that show watching that show makes me hungry, man. Yeah, man. I, I love to cook. I love to I love to write some stand up comedy jokes and whatnot. I just love connecting with people in general. I'm a very social person. And so any way that I can do that, whether it be with me painting a picture or me telling a joke or me cooking your delicious bomb meal, you know, it, it's whatever it is that I could possibly do. Absolutely. I feel that man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, Jerron, check out his uh, Instagram and I don't, you do have you posted a lot of your paintings on your, your no I ha and look and like for the people that ask me about that all the time um, really what it is is that I have really bad ADHD <laughs> I have really bad ADHD really tell in us a, about it John. In, in addition to being a very curious person uh, who likes to dabble in a lot of different things at once it's very hard to uh, time manage and make time for the things I want to do as much as I possibly can but I do paint uh, as often as I possibly can. But the thing is, though, I just don't finish work as often as I should. And so that makes it hard for me to post a lot of it on my Instagram because I don't want to give people a bunch of work in progress pictures of the same artwork over and over and over again. Like, also, when are you going to finish that's, it? Yeah, that, when are you going to finish it? That's a good point. Now, you know what I, I mean? I recently, I guess really more within the last year, like when I first started making beats, it was like, you know, I would you know, just be chilling with by myself and then like, oh man, this beats hard, you know, like this is dope. And then it would just be either like a little idea and then I would just go back and listen to it over and over and over and mm -hmm. then nothing would happen with it. <laughs> but like really, I've, I've learned that you just have to like, it's almost like when, when it starts to seem like work to me, it's like, oh, I need to mix this beat and I need to finish it and send it out. And it's just like, when I think like that, it's, it's almost just like, it makes me not want to do it but at the same time, it's like, well, I'm going to learn from it and, you know, I'm only going to get better. So I just, I just push myself mm -hmm. to sit down and finish it. And it could be if, if I'm mixing or with anything, like even going to work, you know, going to work at Kroger. It's not just, it's not just uh, with making beats, but that's the big, big, been the biggest thing is sitting down, finishing a beat and really being efficient with it mm -hmm. while also not being put in a box to where, how, what's your experience with? Like I was gonna say, being putting yourself in a box where you're like burnt out. I look at I look at myself and I try to make sure that I'm ever changing and ever adapting, because the way I see it is that if I was already my most optimal or ideal person, I would um, already be living the lifestyle that it is that I want to live. You know what I mean? I live by two philosophies of either it's not your time yet, or you're not applying enough pressure. And so I always look at it as a, I, I should be willing to change myself no matter what, because ultimately I feel more satisfied with being, living the lifestyle that I want to live mm -hmm. than continuing to be the same person that I am right now. You know what I mean? I think I will be much more happy to understand that I'll get, I got where I wanted to get versus I stayed exactly who I was. Because maybe it's necessary for people to change. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so whenever I get stuck in a rut as far as, um, it's like maybe like writer's block or just like a lack of inspiration or a lack of creativity. I, I've never experienced a lack of creativity in any way, shape, or form. Really, I just smoke a little bit of weed and I'm fine. <laughs> That's yeah, all exactly. it takes. Truthfully, it's like, I don't know. I just have so many different ideas. I have a great understanding of what I feel like people need to hear. 
And I just think there's a lot of stories that need to be told that haven't been told yet. You know what I mean? And so, uh, especially, like, think about now, like, there's so much going on in the world right now. Like, how could you how could you not have something to talk about? How could you not have any type of inspiration from all the chaos that's going around everybody? You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, that's that's a good point. So how how is the the virus... Man, you're you're touching. Man, I've been you're, I've been I've been living it up since this virus been out. Of well, what are you? So, what have you been doing? In what have you seen in 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 Louisville especially that has been like, man, that's like what what you've been seeing recently? How has it affected your creativity? Is the biggest? Uh, I would say it's affected my creativity. The main thing it's affected for me is that I can't perform my stand up comedy shows right now. That sucks. Okay. But uh, ultimately, though, I've been getting a lot of material from the things that are going on around me. Truthfully, my life's been a movie, Kevin. I'm not gonna lie to you. Jerome's my life, life is a movie. My life during quarantine has been an absolute movie. Um, there's been nothing but just bottles and, and, and bitches and, and 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 I knew this was coming. <laughs> and a whole bonanza. And so bonanza. No, but honestly though, this quarantine has made me think about life and things. I feel like some things that bad happen happen for a reason. And I think there's a lot of things that we all can learn from the situation. Truthfully, I feel like this gives a lot of people a, a second to breathe, which is a great thing, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people talk about how there's a lot of things that they want to do that they can't do because they don't have enough time to. And this really shows them also, no, it's not that you don't have enough time to, you don't make enough time for it. You right. know what I mean? You need to make more time. Absolutely. And again, sit down and just do it and make yourself do it. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, no, this quarantine for me has just really been a very eye-opening experience as far as understanding what it is I need to do as a person to get myself to the next step. But then also, um, I don't know, it helps me to be just be more relatable to other people. Like, I think about all of my problems and I get very selfish, but I also think, like, you know, Jerome, everyone's going through the same thing that you're going through right now, too. You know, I can't perform stand-up comedy, but Dwayne Sutton might not go pro. You know <laughs> no, what I mean? Nah. Like, he's I mean, going of course, pro. he's going to play again over the year pro. and whatnot. But, like, you I get my with point. Him like, Emmanuel, just yeah, yeah, you get my point, though. There's a lot of different stuff that a lot of people are, are having right. to deal with right now. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's a totally. It's and so, a, like, I just think it's, it, it makes me a lot more empathetic and it makes me just, like, uh, sympathize with a lot of people that are going through a lot more than what I am. Because, truthfully, I'm living great right now. Yeah, I feel that. Yo, what's up, Nikki? How you doing? Say what's up. That's Nikki D'Ambrosio. Hey, Nikki D'Ambrosio. How you doing? Hey, Nikki. So it's the best support in the world. That's Man, my for girl. Sure. That's my girl. But yeah, um, I was going back a little bit what we were saying earlier about what you said. Uh, you know, it's either not your time or you said something else. But you're not it, applying enough pressure. You're not applying enough pressure. I think that right now, a lot of people are realizing. It, me especially, like I, I've really been a firm believer always in everybody's got a different path, mm-hmm. and you know, it may just not be your time. But then again, you're not may not be applying enough pressure. But right now. It's it, there's very limited a pressure to be a pressure to be applied because just with the certain the standards and the quarantine. I don't think that's true at all. And the reason why I say that is that um, some people think that pr- applying pressure is about applying or exerting yourself to finish something or, or, or do something or put yourself out there. Sometimes applying pressure could be preparation. You know what I mean? That's Kevin, true. Kevin, you could have plenty of things that you're doing right now that are preparing you for when things open up to really have your foot on everyone's neck. You know what I mean? That's true. And it's really just about how you want to approach things. Everyone can make it seem that there's nothing that I could possibly do to get to the next level right now. Mm-hmm. But while you're thinking that, there's somebody else who's thinking, no, like I'm definitely trying to make sure that I'm on top and that whenever this is over, that it is my last year being broke. You know what I mean? There you so go. So it's yeah. really just about how you approach things, honestly. Like, still me, like, I've been doing podcasts, I've been doing short films, I've been having parties, I've been getting bitches, I've been whoa, doing whoa, whatever. you've been having parties, Jerron? <laughs> what? I mean, like, when oh I say parties, gosh. I mean, like, oh I mean, gosh. like, you know, we have a couple of little days out at the crib, you know, you get a bunch of bottles and it really ain't kind of late, Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Right. No, honestly, all of that, the part of the, people don't realize this too, though. As a stand-up comedian, I still have to do things with them in my life in order to have things to talk about. You know what I'm saying? I can't sit in my house every day and quarantine. Well, I mean, I can, but I don't want to. <laughs> right? I can't right. sit around and do nothing and expect to have a lot of material to talk about. You know what I mean? That's true. And so it's like I have to live a very eventful life. I mean, not a superficial eventful life, but just an honest eventful life in order for me to really... Um, have a lot of consistent things to talk about. I want to make sure that I always have new material and new things to talk about. And I want to show people that, you know, Jerron's life really is a movie. Okay. I feel that. Yeah. So the, so you may not be, you're saying kind of like it may not, you may not be directly doing exactly what your focus yeah, is. Yeah, no, there's definitely but like, people look at that. Okay. Like for example, um, a lot of people can use this right now to get in a great mental space. You know what I mean? A lot of people, um, I think, I think, I think there are more people who 
are not mentally as strong as they should be the people that are. You know what I'm saying? I think that um, mental strength is something you have to consistently work on in order to get there. And it really takes you having to understand that um, you have to be able to look at things in a very negative light mm-hmm. in order to have a full understanding of what it is that you need to change or what it is that you need to improve about yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so uh, during this time, I mean, this is a great time to look at the mirror, look back at yourself, look about what things you want, what things like, you need to learn about yourself. And like, we just go on a deep mental journey. You know what I mean? I, I really encourage everybody to get very in tune with who they are as a person during this time where you're really just at home by yourself all day or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, there's different things that you can come out with from this quarantine where it's like, I still feel like I'm in a better space than what I was before. You know what I mean? Whether it being financially, whether it being um, mentally, whether it just being like you pursuing what it is that you are really seeing after. You know what I mean? But that's, that's just my own personal opinion. Hmm. That's interesting. It's, there's so people have so many different opinions, especially right now. Uh, we got Avery in the live. Hey, shout out to Avery. Yeah, How you doing, up, Avery? Avery? I see you at Another. O'Shea's every Saturday. Yes, Sersky. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's right, yeah. Oh, what's up, Julia? Hey, <laughs> what's up? Hey, Nikki, Avery, and Julia have shown a lot of love and support on my mm-hmm. Lush Louisville Instagram. Those are my. They, we go way back. All mm-hmm. of them. And uh, but yeah, what was I saying about? Oh yeah, the the. With the quarantine, have you heard, had you heard of Zoom before the quarantine started? You know, it's crazy. I was working at this job called AmeriSafe for about all of five or six days. <laughs> and, uh, tell tell us it, about it. What, pretty what, much what it was. It was, like a, it was like a mortgage consultant job or whatever. I was on the phone as a CSS calling people, asking about mortgages, boop, 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 whatever. What people don't realize about me is I have ADHD. But, I have ADHD, and my mom smoked a lot of weed with me when I was a baby. And so I have a memory problem as well. But Maybe that's main, why you're so creative. Exactly. But the main thing is, though, is that um, my ADHD really makes it hard for me to sit in a space on a phone talking to somebody that's a stranger for a, a significant amount of time without having to get up and do something, right? And these people just very much so had me fucked up at this job, so I quit. <laughs> but yes, to respond to your question, I have been on Zoom before, yes. I, I had not, and my... My mom had a, her birthday was like the second week of quarantine. Mm. So my dad got all of her side of the family and all of his side of the family to do a huge Zoom call. Because you can have like up to, what is it, like a hundred, it's probably more than a hundred people in one video, right? Oh, I didn't know that. No, I'm know pretty that. sure it, it's at least a hundred, man, that, man, that's a lot of people. But, but we had like, probably like... 30, 40 people in one video. I mean, it was chaos because mm-hmm. you, you have everybody's audio on and everybody's trying to hear it, but it was just funny. But that was the first time I'd heard of it. And that, and then, like, I guess it's because there's no, like, there must not be a video limit of who who all you can have in the, in the, in the Zoom. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, so if you, uh, when it, when it first came out, <laughs> what's up, mom? <laughs> <laughs> mom's uh doing something in the laundry room but um when it first came out i forgot what i was saying zoom <laughs> zoom yeah it, but it, you know and it just blew up i feel like it just everybody started using it during the quarantine mm-hmm. oh mitch just said his cousin's about to have a zoom wedding mitch who my buddy in, in florida oh okay never mind mitch how? Where are they, where are they getting Hold married? On, wait, we, got, we got my boy Savvy B in here tonight. Shout out to my boy Brian. Yeah, he followed me. The yeah, other day. Sarsky. Uh, who, who is that? He's a good friend of mine. He makes music. Uh, that's the dude I was telling you about who was going to have a, uh, a listening party. Oh, okay, so. okay. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hit my DM, bro. I'm trying to have you on the show for real. Mm-hmm. He, he, I, I got on his Instagram page when he followed me. He look, looks legit. Mm-hmm. Where Where's he record at? Uh, I think he records with my friend DJ. He's also at uh, Studio 400. But back to this interview. You got some more questions yeah, for Yeah, me? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we were talking about Zoom. Yeah, I got some more questions about you. Speak on speak on your comedy and your, your shows. Okay. You so um, I was actually very impressed with my first couple of shows that I had before when I was doing shows at Zebra. Before prior to that, I was working and doing shows at uh, the Comedy Caravan. But the hard part about that was that uh, I wasn't able to perform as much as I wanted to. I was only performing maybe once or twice every uh, month or so, maybe every two weeks or three weeks. And uh, they was only giving me like three to five minute sets, you know, which wasn't enough time for me to really get a chance to practice what it is I want to do mm-hmm. or work on my craft. Right. And um, so I just wanted to try to take the time to myself to like kind of create my own opportunities. Luckily, I was able to meet uh, this lady Jig that works at uh, 
I worked as a promoter at, at Z Bar, and luckily she was able to help me start doing some comedy nights there. It really just gave me a lot of control with it. She told me that I can um, really take control over the entire night um, as far as like what comedians I want to have, what type of things I want to incorporate for the show, and uh, I was very thankful for that. And um, yeah, it went really well. My first show, I didn't have a phone. I had plenty of jokes about how I didn't have a phone, but um, <laughs> yeah, I remember that. I, I, it, it was very good. I remember the. I think the venue only holds two hundred and twenty people, but we ended up having about um, one hundred and thirty, one hundred and forty come out for the first show, and then we had another show. I think two weeks after that, and it was about one hundred and sixty people there. Uh, I, I love the idea that I have now have a, a platform and a place to be able to just be able to connect with a lot of people and give people a different side of me that they don't always see. Uh, I hope to whenever uh, this is, this quarantine's all over, I really want to open up a new uh, chapter of comedy that I'm going to do just because I like some of the comedy that I was doing before, but I just think it's different levels that I can take it. And um, truthfully, I just want to see, I feel like some people know me, but they don't know the real Jerron. They don't get to see different layers of who I am as a person. Okay. So uh, with this new comedy that I'm going to do, I'm going to start trying to peel back more layers of who I am as a person and start trying to get a little more in introspective and uh, just, I don't know, talk about things that relate people more and uh, just try to find a lot of the different things that I can like... Uh, just do this, like show my intellect and just show different sides of myself. I think people just only see hornball drawn sometimes <laughs> or just see like but drawn you, the dude from the West End or whatever. You know what I mean? I just want to show them like there's different levels that I can take it and different avenues and different ventures that I can go with my stand up comedy. Are you, what are some, so you've done it at Z Bar. Where mm -hmm. else are you looking to perform? Uh, well, I mean, I've done it at Z Bar and I've done it at the Comedy Caravan, but I've also done stand up comedy in Los Angeles. And, um, that was a decent day. Uh, what happened when out there, I mean, again, I'm a very unlucky person. My phone <laughs> broke while I was in the airport. And so um, before I could even really get back to my hotel, I didn't have a phone. And I missed out on Wait, in the airport where? LAX. That's right. Yeah, yeah but yeah. Um, no, like That's my phone broke airport. while I was out there. And uh, I missed out on some of the shows that I was supposed to have. But one of the shows that I did have, the last show that I signed up for, I thought it was supposed to be a ladies' night. And it uh, turns out that it was LGBT night. <laughs> oh, yeah. You told this joke. Yeah. <laughs> turns out that it was LGBT night. But honestly, I think the show still went well. It was a learning experience for me. Uh, they just didn't like a lot of the different jokes that I had. Uh, some of them did. But like, honestly, it wasn't even that large of a crowd for me to really have a understanding of. I don't know. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I didn't let it bother me too much at all. But, um, yeah, now I'm just working on writing as much material as I can and just seeing, like, what different levels I can take and what different ways can I just uh, learn to stand out as a comedian mm -hmm. and see, like, for example, Dave Chappelle, he's known as a person who's, like, able to cross a lot of different fine lines and um, still have people laugh. And He's my favorite comedian. Yeah, it's, it's, and that's why he's a lot of different people's com a favorite comedian because he can really speak so much truth while still being able to make people laugh at it. You but how does he do that? Uh, it's a thing in, in comedy called dodging lasers. And what that means is if you're able to say something offensive and someone laughs, you just dodge your laser. You know what what I mean? if nobody laughs? Then you did it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but what happens it. if you don't? No one laughs. You get booed off stage? That's, that's, that's called not doing well. You know what I mean? Okay. If people aren't laughing at your show, you're not doing well. There's been plenty of times, and like people think that dodging really? lasers is like a, it's like a, you have to be talking about very deep water stuff to do that. There's been literally times where I've had just a bunch of white girls at my show, and I said something about how white girls aren't shit, and then it doesn't work out that well. You know what I mean? I didn't dodge that laser, <laughs> and so I've just learned that. Um, yeah, but they still come to your show, right? I mean, I'm Jerron, so they're gonna come. Oh, but I mean, the thing is absolutely. though, that's that's not what I'm trying to. My point is though, um, that's what he's known for. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There are other comedians that are known for uh, a lot of different other things, but I don't think that's what I'm just gonna be known for. Is like being a person that can push boundaries and whatnot. I think more so with my comedy now, it's gonna be me being a more introspective person to really um, have people relate to the different mental spaces that a lot of people are in and whatnot, and like just have people relate to a lot of the different shit that other people are going through. You know what I mean? Right. And so. Um, yeah, no, I'm just excited. I'm excited for the opportunity to still keep continue to do what I do whenever things uh, open up. Sometime here soon, I want to start trying to get into more auditions and whatnot, or even just get to the space where um, I'm able to like get a manager and start performing out of state or whatnot. You know what I mean? But yeah, that's the goal, man. The goal is just to keep performing and uh, hopefully have a tour or something of that nature. Now, that's my buddy Alex. That ain't no six feet. Here, yeah. Here's the thing, man. I'm uh, <laughs> my immune system is pretty impeccable. And I haven't touched Kevin since I've, since I've seen him, so I feel like he's going to be okay. I, come on, Kevin. Sorry. <laughs> but, no, nah, yeah. Um, so so you're in, into some into music. Mm -hmm. You're doing making some songs. Yeah, I've been making a little bit of music lately. I really just want to be the next Waka Flocka. But, uh, <laughs> I could tell in one of those songs that you had, it no, seemed um, very lit. 
Wait, wait, someone just asked a question. They said, how challenging is it to find auditions in the Louisville for stand-up comedy? Good question, Julia. Well, truthfully, Good question. truthfully, shout out to Julia. Truthfully, I don't look for very many auditions um, at the moment just because of things that are going on in the world. But um, truthfully for me, I think while being in Louisville, it's more so about trying to create opportunities for myself while they look for those. Um, like, for example, instead of me looking for auditions and whatnot, I've started to try to look, get into screenwriting and I've been looking at master classes about independent filmmaking with Spike Lee and whatnot, and like learning how to like do things on my own yeah. versus trying to um, look for other people to like grant me opportunities or take advantage of those opportunities and whatnot. And so, uh, it, I mean, people, I really encourage people to do that because like you learn after well, like after creating your own platform, you get to start to understand. Um, I really now have the ability to do way much more than I would have if I was just on someone else's platform taking advantage of their opportunities, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. It's a difference between like being in a movie and the movie does well, and so you get fame because of the movie versus being in a movie or making a movie and the movie does well, and now you have a platform because you just... Did it. It's a difference between being a, a, an actor that does well in a movie versus being Jordan Peele who made Get Out and now you're Jordan Peele. You know what I mean? Like You can you can be the person that like creates opportunities and not the person that has to take advantage of them. You know what I mean? So, but, um, yeah, I feel that. Yeah, but like truthfully... Um, Auditions have not been very easy for me recently. It's one of those things that like, I just keep looking online. That's why I encourage people to try to get some sort of manager or, or some type, sort of representative just because it puts a lot more validity and legitimacy in what it is that you're doing. Now, did you have to audition for your thing, your shows at Z-Bar? No. Truthfully, what it was is that my friend uh, Domby, shout out to Domby, he's a DJ, uh, aka DJ Dixie Highway. I'll go check him out if I can. Um, Dixie Highway. He um, he did a lot of, he did a lot of uh, DJing sets at um, Z-Bar. And I was also doing uh, hosting with him and hosting with Ronnie Luciano whenever he would have a couple of sets at um, a Z Bar. Shout out to Ronnie as well. And um, the promoter had seen me just doing and stand up, uh, making people laugh and whatnot while I was on the mic while they were playing music and whatnot. And she just reached out to me and was on some, um, you know, I think that you're very good at what you do. I just looked at your Instagram recently and I think you're very funny. Uh, we want to try to incorporate because I know they were trying to just make more money at Z Bar. They were trying to incorporate something they could do on Mondays. It's a nice place. I had yeah. never been there. It, yeah, they're trying to, your show. They were trying to figure out just some ways that they could um, do something for for Mondays and whatnot. And I, just, you know, we talked about the idea of having a stand up comedy jam or just a stand up comedy night and whatnot. And um, we just learned to uh, expand on it and whatnot since the first two shows. Because I remember the first show, she only had a couple of tables off for maybe about fifty people, and I was like, you know, that's not going to be enough. <laughs> that's not going to be enough. John said, "Do you know who I am?" No, I mean. <laughs> Hey, there was that. a lot of people there. It that was a first lot of show. people. It was. And it was so a lot now, of like, since we have an understanding that we do have a following, do have people that are going to be there that want to uh, see us do well, uh, we're just trying to see how we can expand on that. You know, we're thinking about very soon trying to have more um, music shows. We're thinking about possibly trying to have an intermission where we have a first show and a second show. Uh, we're thinking about possibly trying to do uh, ladies' nights and men's nights and all things of that nature. Mm -hmm. But um, it's really just about it's really just about just trying to get our foot in the door. And now that we're there, we're just going to see how really we can expand on it. Pretty soon, too, I want to try to see about trying to pay other comedians to come from out of state to perform there in headline. Perform. And then, you know, I, I go before them or anything of that nature. You know what I mean? But Yeah, I can I can definitely speak on um, what you were saying about Julia's question about the auditions in Louisville. Like, you got to make it for yourself, for real. I've been spending a lot of time learning about branding and marketing myself as a producer. Mm -hmm. And, like, you know, you got to build a following somehow. Mm -hmm. Like, I cannot tell you how many times – Especially a lot of the kids I went to school with, I studied audio production at Middle Tennessee State, and there was a lot of producers there, a lot of very talented people too. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, half the time I'd be like, "Yo, like, can I hear some of your stuff?" Do you? Do so you I want to, I want to ask you a question real quick. Did you go to school with Take Key? Yes, I did go to school. See, with See, look, Keith. Kevin went to school with Take Key. I, I did go to school with Take Key. Take Key be too hard. I t hey, I talked to him once at a tailgate, and he Facetimed six nine right there in front of me. I'm not kidding, but six <laughs> six nine didn't answer. But um, what was I? Say? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'd forgotten about that. Um. Yeah, so branding, yeah, branding and marketing. I'm I put beats out. All, well, recently I've been focused on trying to get this podcast ready. So, but I was putting beats out every day on my YouTube and my SoundCloud and Beat Stars, mm -hmm. and like I'm I just put out a beat tape and uh, on SoundCloud and building a following is so important. But uh, what I was saying about a lot of the producers at MTSU were like, well, I don't want to put my stuff out because I don't want it to get stolen. I'm like, okay, well think about that because first of all, if you're a producer. How are you going to get a following? Like yeah. you can, you can, you can. So you send your beats out. 
somebody records on your beat and doesn't tell you about it. Okay, you put your stuff on SoundCloud, YouTube, people, SoundCloud to MP3, YouTube to MP3, and down, you would never know about you it, but you're getting your name you, out you there. You know how you sue them, first of all. Well, you can but if you, if, if, and even if it's. What people have to realize is that um, people, a lot of people let fear get in the way of their success. Exactly. And, and it, um, it, it, you have to build a following. You I, have to put yourself out there. I think more so than even building a following, I think people have to learn to just be fearless. You know what I mean? Like, I'm a very fearless person. I don't have any type of. Uh, notion as to like what I'm going to be next you know what I mean or what mm -hmm. I'm going to go but like I just try to make sure I don't let fear try to uh, make decisions for myself as far as what I want to do you know what I mean like I feel there that. are a lot of different important life decisions that people can make or want to make but they don't because of fear you I, know what I, I mean? feel that man so, that's why uh, I'm doing all this exactly that's why exactly. I'm putting my beats so like, for out for example people that want to put beats on YouTube but they are scared that someone's going to take the idea like that's getting in the way of them building it. That's the music the business yeah, <laughs> in, in general. That's in art. General. No, that's not even music. That's art. You don't think people steal my jokes mm -hmm. and tell them to their friends? You know what I mean? Like, Do you don't think people steal Dave Chappelle's jokes? Who? Who would steal it? You, you would know. No, yeah. you wouldn't. Unless they're famous. That's the Dave whole Chappelle point. is famous. The person who steals it. But joke. everybody knows Dave Chappelle, though. The person who No, they don't. I think not that. everybody knows who Dave is. So, so if I go up to your mom right now and I tell her a Dave Chappelle joke, do you, she's gonna know that was Dave Chappelle. No, true. The true. whole point is though, you can't let stuff like that make make decisions as for what you want to do. You I agree. I mean? That's what I'm saying. I agree. I just I, when people would say like, I don't want people to steal my stuff. I'm like, bro, your stuff is probably gonna get stolen maybe a few times, especially with beats in the music industry. That's just how it goes. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you're, I mean, we have to, have to I'll have to ask Tay Keith. How, you know what ha what happened with uh, how if he ever had that experience or anything like that you know but mm -hmm. man you just gotta put yourself out there and like you said be fearless that's a great that's a great uh, great way to put it be fearless mm -hmm. so good comedy clubs in Louisville enlighten us truthfully. There's not really a lot of them. I'm going to be honest. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. Z-Bar seems I, cool. Z, the Z-Bar is not even a comedy club. That's the thing. Yeah. I turned it into a comedy club on Mondays. Truthfully, I'm sorry. Jerron's Truthfully. famous. No, I'm not famous. I just did well. and I, I had some unexpected success. Absolutely. But, um, no, um, I know there's a, there's a the, the Cavalier. Uh, I know they have uh, some different comedy clubs that are on Barstow that are very good. The Comedy Caravan, I encourage everyone to go out to that one as well. But um, truthfully, I don't think there's a lot of different places. There's not really one place or space where a lot of people can go uh, and do stand-up comedy or even practice a stand-up comedy. And that's what I want to change. I never want to, I want to change in, in, in Kentucky and whatnot. Yeah. And um, as soon as I'm able to do that, it's just going to be one of those things where, um, I mean, I just want to open up a lot more opportunities and ideas for people. You know what I mean? Like, I want to get people uh, acclimated to the idea of being able to go out on a certain night and go and laugh. You know what I mean? Like that was. A, what are what are good comedy nights? Like, is there like a? I mean, I don't know. I think Mondays was a good day. I didn't really choose to do it on Mondays, but I thought Mondays was a good day because some people are off on Mondays, some people don't have shit to do the next day. You know what I mean? Some people already. Act, I don't know. You know what I mean? But yeah. the the thing is though, I, I just want to get people used to the idea of even going out to comedy events in general. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's cool, yeah. So who are some other fellow comedians that you... Like, I know your buddy Jaquar, right? That I mean, Jaquar is funny without trying to be. That's not Jaquar. Jaquar is not really a comedian. He's more so just a goofy individual. Uh -huh. But my friend Amron is very com is very funny. He's a comedian as well. A shout out to Amron, by the way. Uh, I have a friend, Eric Kimbrough. He does stand-up comedy at um, Comedy Caravan. He's funny as well. Uh, there's a lot of different other people that I can speak for in, in Kentucky that are very uh, funny as well. Some of my favorite comedians worldwide, though, I would say is definitely um, Dave Chappelle. I'm a huge Cat Williams fan as well. I'm a huge fan of uh, Mike Epps. Uh, I think Daniel Tosh is very funny. I think he is able to put um, uh, humor into like some dark spaces sometimes. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I think I like him too because like he makes very like. Uh, racist or misogynistic or joke, but it's like he makes jokes that towards everyone, so you can't feel like he's like targeting a single group of people. You know yeah. what I mean? He's another person that crosses a lot of lines and whatnot as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of different comedians that I like uh, in general. I like Martin Lawrence and DC Young Fly because they have a different type of stand up where it's more yeah. active and more of a, a physical humor than it is a, a humor that comes from what they're saying. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're just some funny individuals. But yeah, Chris Rock, he's funny as well. I think he's kind of all of that in the one. I, I wasn't a huge fan of his recent Netflix, The Tambourine. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't think it was that funny. I, I don't know. I just, I, that was just me, but I'll have to watch it again. Mm -hmm. But he, he, he is funny. 
Um, I see we got a couple questions here. Uh, Mitch is saying on the uh, live chat, he's asking Jerron, what's the biggest misconception people have about you being a stand-up comic? Okay, well, people don't understand about being a stand-up comedian. Um, every stand-up comedian wants to push boundaries because that's how you get to be known as a great comedian. We are not trying to piss you people off when we tell these jokes, okay? Like, no one is trying to go up on stage and change anyone's outlook on something or their, or their viewpoint or anything of that nature. I'm not trying to convince you that white girls are full of shit when I say that white girls are full of shit. You know what I mean? Wait a second. It seems like I created that oh, I try to, um, you know, just give you a different outlook. The whole thing about being a comedian is about having a hot take. Or just having a different perspective than most people. Or just a way that you tell stories that people laugh at. You know what I mean? There's different ways that people can be funny. What you have to realize is, you all being sensitive all the time does not help us be able to entertain you all at all. You know what I mean? this camera too. But, <laughs> but <laughs> I, was um, doing the same I think that was thing. another question that they had. Have you yeah, heard about... Uh, oh, performed at the Bardstown. Julia's asking. No, I've heard of the Bardstown. There were times before where... Um, Missy, one of the promoters at the Comedy Caravan, that talked to me about the possibility of me being able to perform over there. But then again, um, I'm not a fan of five-minute sets anymore. You know what I mean? I write a lot of jokes, and I think that um, I would love to go over there and have some great practice and whatnot, but I just think that it's very hard to write jokes. Like, like Kevin, if you wanted to really tell a story, like, is it going to take only five minutes? And that, that's one joke. You know what I mean? Like, you tell one story, that's, that's one joke, really. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's more of a... Understand of like just being able to have as more of an opportunity to be able to tell uh, a lot of jokes at once. You know what I mean? I don't want a thirty minutes set each time I perform, but I just think you know seven minutes or ten minutes that that is gonna intrigue me more about the possibility of me trying to perform. Like for example, I performed at the University of Louisville for this Kappa event that they had, and they gave me and yeah, Emron. Cool. It was it was it was amazing. They yeah. gave me and Emron fifteen minute sets. You know what I mean? And so it's like I, it wasn't even the fact that um, I was getting paid for or anything of that nature, but it was like. I have another opportunity. One, I have a different uh, environment of people that I usually talk to. You know what I mean? Okay. Uh, and then two, uh, it's just the fact that 15 minutes, I actually have an opportunity to tell a great amount of stories and uh, it's a, a, an opportunity to just be able to really work on my craft. You know what I mean? I don't think three minutes every three months is enough time for yeah. me to really work on my craft. So, so do you approach it from, I guess you kind of just said, but like, so you can, would you rather... Tell a bunch of jokes or a seven-minute story that's a really good joke. People have to realize that um, any great stand-up comedian fits in a lot of punchlines within their, their, their material. If you laugh only once every seven minutes during a set, that person's not very funny. You know what I mean? The point is, though, uh, with a longer set, you have more freedom of writing. That's a good point. You know what I mean? I didn't really think about yeah, that. Yeah, you have, you have more freedom of writing. I don't want to just be able to tell one story and then you all laugh because then I walked off the stage and I only got one laugh from you all. You know what I mean? Yeah. You want to be able to fit as many punchlines into a, a certain time as frame as, as possible. Mm -hmm. That's the funniest thing about Dave Chappelle is that you watch an hour of stand up and you've laughed probably thirty six times. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you you laughed so many times. And so that's the point is being able to fit as many punchlines and opportunities for people to laugh as, as possible so that people walk away knowing that you were funny. You know what I mean? And I just yeah. think that. Having a three minute or a five minute set, it just only gives people sort of an idea of what you're capable of. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that was good for me starting off, but I think now it's like I, I'm at a space now where I really want to show people I can take things to a much a deep level, deeper level. I can really talk about different things from a different perspective, a different standpoint, but I can't do all of that with a three to five minute set. You know what I mean? Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I don't, I have never known really anything much about comedy especially in louisville stand-up comedy is hard man like yeah well you don't obviously you you really got to put yourself at, like it's easy for me to make a beat and put it out yeah and people don't like it whatever but <laughs> you're, you're gonna know to, one of the hardest things to do is to be a public speaker yeah i bet i mean like that's one thing that everyone struggles with you know truthfully like a lot of people have a fear of speaking in, a, in front of an audience you know what i mean luckily for me i don't have very much anxiety at all and i i feel anxious only like at very rare occasions in my life you know what I mean mm -hmm. and, like my first few shows I was very like, relaxed until it was time for me to perform it's like the first me walking on stage you know what I mean mm -hmm. like but um yeah no stand up comedy it's like uh, if you're very comfortable talking to people if you're very comfortable just um telling a story or just being able to connect with people then I think it's something that you, you should definitely try and again people who want to do stand up comedy uh, please reach out to me I love helping people uh, being able to get started just being able to try to get involved and um 
Yeah. Yeah, man. Comedy, it's, it's a great thing to do. I feel like a rapper, but I don't even have to rhyme on stage. You know what I mean? And That's like, a plus. I, like, I'm I guess. Getting, I'm getting paid the same. I don't want to say the same amount, but you mean I'm, I'm a single entertainer. I'm 50K a single, for a show. I'm, I'm a single performer on stage. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, if I do get successful, that's how Kevin Hart is so famous. He he really gets paid rapper money. He's well, selling yeah, out he, arenas and whatnot yeah. the same way that a rapper would, but it's for stand-up comedy. Yeah, he's, so, that's a good point, dude. Yeah, yeah, he, you like Kevin Hart? I mean, he's all right. Well, some of his older stuff is pretty good. I think that uh, fame has kind of tainted a lot of his uh, material and whatnot. Yeah. But, um, I mean, he's a very talented individual. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he definitely is. He... I don't know. I just think some of his stuff sometimes is just not extra, but it's just like I don't know, just kind of boring. I guess I don't know. I haven't watched him in a long time, but mm-hmm. so you know, if people reach out to you for getting in contact with uh, for comedy, where where can we find you? I got your Instagram pulled up here. It looks like at Haran Gerst. Yeah, or Gerst. Yeah, it's just uh, <laughs> and for people who don't know, my name's not Haran. It's not. But um, it's just the first letter of my first name and the first letter of my last name and a switch. But um, no, if you all are ever looking to me for me to do stand-up comedy, for me to host one of your events, or do stand-up comedy at a, at a venue that you have, or uh, just looking for me to help with you getting started with your stand-up comedy career, uh, again, you can DM me on Instagram. I could probably give you my phone number. I won't say it on here just because I don't trust a lot of people. But um, Can't trust nobody. Can't. But, um, no, yeah, just reach out to me, man. I'm always open. Uh, you know, you can just tell me what your budget is if you want me to, uh, you know, do something for you. If you don't have a budget, just, I mean, you can still talk, but don't be mad if I hang up. But, um, yeah, no, I, I encourage people <laughs> to reach out to me at, at all just times. Just out of nowhere, just hang up. I mean, like, no, like, uh, we can definitely get some things going. I, I feel like there hasn't really been a, a, a real um, market or really an, uh, an environment for stand-up comedy in Louisville. Like, like Kevin, whenever you think about a, a comedian from Louisville, who do you think about? You. Other than myself. Other than myself. <laughs> I need about to say that. Other than myself. Uh, I don't know any. Exactly. Uh, and so now it's time to try to open things up. Try to open up so, opportunities for people to feel like stand-up comedy is an option for them. So is that a goal there. of yours? Yeah. That's I mean, I, I have a lot of goals. But, I mean, yeah, especially with the fact that if I'm doing stand-up comedy, I feel like I'm starting to get somewhere from it. I want everyone else that lives with me to feel like they can... Well, that's from my hometown. I feel like they can they can do the same thing as well. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's dope, man. Uh, Mitch got one question. He he says, "Have you had any crazy heckler moments?" Crazy heckler moments? Yeah, when I was at that LGBT show in LA, there was a couple of uh, I think there was a transgender Filipino woman that didn't like some of the jokes that I had about um, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. Well, pretty much what I was saying was in my jokes, I was talking about. Hillary Clinton, and I was talking about the idea that if she tries to get reelected or, or, or run, or, I mean, if she tries to run for a uh, president again with in twenty twenty, yeah, this year, this was about a, two yeah, years ago. Yeah. But if I was, if she tries to run again with Bernie Sanders, we have to all come together and decide to not vote for her because she already lost to a black man and an old racist white man. <laughs> so I was like, you know, I feel like if you lost to both of those, like you've already had your shot. Who are you gonna beat? Yeah. They didn't laugh at that very much at all, but I mean, I, I said it very differently at the time. But um, other than that, heckler, um, I did have my friend Langston at my first comedy show, uh, screeching out Dude, drunk. He was, the time. he was so he was, drunk. He was, he was smashed. Drunk. He was hilarious, but he pissed me off because he made me forget one of my jokes. I was telling the joke about how I lost my phone and uh, how I got on Facebook Market and I was trying to buy another phone, and I forgot to mention the fact that the dude. Who I bought the phone from on Facebook. Tell us his name. name. His name was True Finesse, you all. <laughs> True Finesse. And I, I, I thought you'd that. be smarter than that. And, too, I, and I didn't Seriously. see that because whenever you whenever you get on Facebook Market and you buy stuff from the Facebook Market, they only show the person's first name. So I'm typing and True. I'm writing the guy and I'm just seeing True. <laughs> Seems like an honest guy. Seems like a very honest he gotta guy. Be. He's gotta be an honest guy. Seems like a very honest guy. Okay, okay. What does it say? Have you heard? Okay, that's the same question I was looking for. <laughs> um, what was I gonna say? You talking about your your story on with the transgender? Well, okay, so the clubs in L.A. What are those like? Um, are they full on comedy clubs? Yeah, no, they definitely have plenty of comedy clubs out there. Uh, it's different. It just depends on what comedy club you go to. You know what I mean? They have some very large ones like the Laughter Factory or whatnot that are just really clubs that you know you go there. It's 100, 200 people there for you to perform stand up comedy in front of. And then the place that I went that was an LGBT night that uh, was called the Dow Comedy Club. It was kind of close to Koreatown in uh, Hollywood, actually. And um, 
I mean, it was fine. It was a very, it was a much smaller venue. Honestly, I feel like my bedroom was bigger than the venue that was there. But I mean, it was for it real. Was, yeah, no, honestly, it, it was not. I mean, I wouldn't say that. That was that was an exaggeration. Well, so how do you feel about the more intimate settings versus like a? I look at everything like that as practice. You know what I mean? Like it's different whenever I'm I'm when I can only perform for five minutes in, in my hometown. That's a good point. Every two you weeks. You might as well put as much being, into it. Yeah, versus me being in L.A. and they say we can give you a five-minute set. And I'm also, I mean, I'm in L.A. I'm about to try to do this as, as well as I can. Yeah, you know absolutely. I mean? Just, I mean, I don't know. I look at, I, look, I try to look at everything as an open experience and as an open opportunity. But again, I try to make sure that I'm not wasting my time either. And I, before, I felt like that was the only thing that I was doing at the Comedy Caravan. Um, I just wasn't able to have the opportunity to really like build my character up and build up a persona for myself mm-hmm. while just only performing as, as short, short as I was. Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I just anyone who feels they're not able to have the opportunity that they, they want, I mean, just try to create opportunities for yourself, truthfully. That's something I want to speak about, what you said, try, uh, uh, wasting, you don't want to waste your time. Uh, so, how do you plan, structure your sets? Yeah, let me hear, let me say this. Okay, quick. go ahead. Um, people... I would say the biggest thing is you got to know your value and know your worth, in, especially in your craft. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I've always been the type, when I was, like, growing up, man, I was super, probably, like, from what I can remember, at least, like, just kind of like, oh, if somebody told me to do something, I'd be like, oh, okay, I'll do it right now. But now I'm like, you know, especially as an intern at a studio and, like, uh, where, where I, like, what am I trying to say? Being, having been an intern, I get told, told and I'm not getting paid. I get told to do stuff that I don't want to do a lot. Now, in certain, of course, I do it, especially this recent internship I've had at Downtown Recording. I mean, I'm going to do that because, first of all, the owner there really likes me and he's got me some good opportunities. But I'm not getting paid, and you have to prove yourself, especially mm-hmm. as an intern, especially in a studio, in a recording studio in the music business. Yeah, you definitely but have to pay dues. Pay, you got to pay dues, but you do have to know your value. Mm-hmm. And, you know, sometimes, like, you know, I'll think and I'll be like, I'm not getting paid for this. I'm not doing that. But I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna tell him. I'm gonna tell the owner or whoever I'm working for. And then, and then, like you know, uh, one time I had I had interned at a studio in Nashville, and I went back there for a day. And I walked in. And as soon as I walked in, this lady, she's a, a, an amazing mastering engineer, super dope. Now, granted, the studio is a very, very uh, high profile. Some some legendary mixing engineers and mastering engineers work there. And so if they ask me to do something, I'm, I'm going to be like, of course, you know, I'm going to help them out. But it was mm-hmm. just like, as soon as I walked in, she was like, she was like, hey, I've got something for you to do. And I was like, I'm not even here on, some, on an intern basis. I'm just here to, I was, I was helping move, mm-hmm. now, I was helping the mixing engineer move one of his consoles. But it ended up not even being at the studio. It was at his warehouse. But but anyways, the same, I mean, nothing came of that situation. I was just like, you know, I was just like, okay, but I'm only going to be here for like five minutes. But, um, you know, know your value, know your worth, and don't be afraid to stick up for yourself. Because if it's somebody that's got experience over you that you're speaking to and speaking with, they'll understand that for the most part. And if they don't, then just tell them, be like, well, I'm sorry, you know. Mm-hmm. That's been my experience. Mm-hmm. I'm going to answer some of these questions yeah, right here. Yeah, go ahead. It says, Jerome, where do you find most of your inspiration for stand-up? Um, most of my inspiration comes from uh, a lot of my life experiences and whatnot. I, like, since I've been trying to work towards a more introspective stand-up comedy and whatnot, it comes from a lot of different like uh, philosophical ideas that I think about all the time, uh, important ideas that I want to get across to other people and whatnot, and I try to do that, and I try to mix um, different examples or different uh, scenarios that have happened in my life with people around me that I know of that can help... Uh, really display or manifest that 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 idea that I have within that philosophy that I thought about. You know what I mean? Like the idea of like coming together, the idea of like just like breaking down racism or things of that nature. You never know. You know what I mean? But like my, my stand up comedy a lot of the time it really comes from my own personal experiences and the things that happen in my life. Just because I do think I live a very eventful life and I feel like whenever I, I tell people a lot of the things that happened in my life, uh, they look at it as if it's not even real. Like you all would not even a thought that she would ever go on the Facebook market and get scammed by somebody named True Finesse. That's such a that's such that's, that's a, such like, a what, juxtaposition such a of, of names. That's such a blockbuster. Like what is that? <laughs> and it says also okay. also do you have plan? So do you plan structure your sets? How okay. Do you, how do you plan to structure your sets? Oh, how do I plan? Okay. So the first set that I had, I I had it very planned out and structured out. And the second set, I didn't plan anything at all. And the, the first set went a lot better than the second. Um, the only reason why I did the second set was that I had never yet done improv stand-up comedy on stage. You know what I mean? And I always wanted to see 
Um, there's different ways that you can write stand-up comedy or whatnot. The same way, there's different ways that you can paint. The same way that you can write music. You know what I mean? Or perform music. And so I want to see, like, Jerron, how are you whenever you are just being your most raw self on stage, saying jokes that just come to your mind? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it went well. I just think that um, I've understood now that it is important to make sure you structure out how you do things and make sure, like, every stand-up comedian knows the importance of like, having a good joke to start with and a good joke to end with as well. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, that's not as capable whenever you're doing uh, improv and whatnot. And so how I structure all of my um, sets now is that each joke starts off with a premise. A premise is just an overall subject, and you have a setup that comes after that. It's how you just set up the joke, how you start off the joke, or how you transition into the joke. Mm-hmm. And then you have a punchline, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then after the punchline, you might have an additional punchline, so it's a tap, and then you might have a transition that goes after that, you know what I mean? And mm-hmm. so uh, that's how I like to structure out a lot of my things. What I do is I try to get as many premises as I can, and then uh, sometimes I don't even start my jokes with all the premises. Sometimes I have a punchline, and then I'm going to say, okay, Jerron, you need to work on a setup that like, works with this punchline. You know what I mean? Okay. And then from that, you can develop a premise. And so there's different ways that you can write your jokes out, but I try to make sure that I write out all of my jokes, and not that I have all of my jokes written out with the setup and punched on the premise. I try to order them in a fashion where it's like, okay, I can do this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. This actually has two jokes, but I'm going to take one of them, and I'm going to use it for the end. And it's gonna be how it's gonna be funny because it was the same punchline as the first joke before. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Yeah. And it's just about understanding how it is that you want to start, how it is that you want to finish, and then I leave a little bit of empty space for myself as well in case I have a heckler that I have to flame up real quick <laughs> or something of that nature. You know what I mean? But yeah, the great question. So thought. so leaving leaving some space for like a heckler or like just kind of like, like some improv. Maybe? I like leaving space because luckily for me at a lot of my shows, um, the performer doesn't mind me going over a couple of minutes. There have been times where I was supposed to perform 30 minutes and I performed like 48. You know what I mean? <gasps> but um, <laughs> no, I just like it because I like to give myself time to breathe. Like if I write out a set where it's like I practice it and it's 30 minutes exactly, I don't like, I, I want to have myself have at least five additional minutes because I want a, a time to breathe on stage. I want a time to where if I tell a joke and it really hits, we all literally laugh together for a second. You know what I mean? And yeah. I run around or whatever happens. You know what I mean? I want an opportunity just to feel like very myself on stage. You know what I mean? To feel very comfortable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. That's interesting. So when your next show, you lining up your next shows already? I mean, honestly, as soon as quarantine is over, as soon as Happy. Z-Bar opens back up, guys, it's going to be like, if Z-Bar were to open up tomorrow, um, I would definitely be talking to my promoter about having a show on Monday. You know what I mean? Like, it's really just about whenever You should it talk to the promoter now anyway. No, no, for sure, for sure. And I'm already in conversation with her as well. It's just the understanding of when the place opens up. Truthfully, if I were to give you all a direct time, I would say late June, early July, we should be having some of our first shows open back up. Realistically, I think. I, I, I could see that. Yeah, I would definitely think like for some of the first weeks of July for sure, uh, we would have some of our shows opening back up. And then from there, too, I've had other comedy comedy caravan, I mean, not comedy caravans, other comedy uh, venues and whatnot reach out to me because they heard about the success that we was having at Z-Bar and uh, talk to me about... Um, what venues? Here in Louisville? Yeah. I just had a few of them here. And um, they've talked to me about the idea of me having my own shows at some of their venues as well, just because, you know, they, 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 they see some of the response that we're getting and they like it. And also, uh, for you all to go to U of L and whatnot, um, I feel like uh, I, w- I should be having some shows there very soon as well. I know there's different fraternities that have reached out to me as well about trying to have some shows there as well. I think your IG Live is saying that we only have a minute and 35 left that we can be on here. I think is that been, a thing? Yeah, I think I think it's the only you shoot for an uh, hour. No, what, so. it, what it is is it's pro- oh for real? Yeah, that might be. Is it my my live my yeah, no, our, screen our, recording? Our, our lapse time now is at like fifty nine minutes, I think. <laughs> yeah, we've been we've been recording on. Well, that's the thing. If we'd been on Zoom, we can only do it, it, the free version, which I have. You only it only allows you to do forty minutes with two people. Mm-hmm. So we'd have been done by now. But <laughs> whatever, we'll just let that run out. But mm-hmm. Julia, Avery, and everybody in the live chat. I saw Jacqueline get in there. Alex, I really appreciate y'all getting in there. I'm gonna shout y'all out on on. Hey, Twitter. love you guys. Yeah, thank by you for all the means, questions. Uh, look at some of my posts hey. on Instagram. Yeah. Look at uh, some of uh, Kevin's beats on YouTube. And my uh, SoundCloud stuff. I, absolutely. My link is in my Instagram bio, I think. I But I'll, if not, I'll put it in. Yo, Kenslow, what's up? You know you know Kenslow, Jerome? I think so. Any of y'all? He's an artist here in Louisville. We had some difficulties working together just because of the quarantine, but he's, he's dope, man. I'm going to get you on here soon, Kenzo. He's a dope guy. Appreciate you, all y'all checking in, tuning in. We got 30. 30 I'm going to stay on YouTube. So y'all get on my YouTube. I'm going to hear from you too, buddy. <laughs> Jump in uh, the live stream. We got a couple people here in the live stream, in the YouTube, in the live chat asking questions. 
Um, you know, so if you're trying to hop my Instagram, about to run out, but we're going to probably still go for a few more minutes. And then uh, this video will be up on the Lush Louisville YouTube page uh, sometime tonight. So I appreciate y'all. All love, really. Appreciate y'all. All right, man. Y'all take care. Y'all be safe. You might as well go ahead and end that out, Kevin. I think that mug's going to stop here in about four, three, two, one. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, you might as well just go and share to IGTV. Next. Ah. Wait, wait, wait. Go back. Go back. Go back. <laughs> just because you want to pick a nice cover for it? I don't think that's the right one. Oh, here, back, yeah, sorry. About that. Right up on the mic. <laughs> oh, wait a uh, oh, we got to. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, you see what I'm saying? Like, you can, okay. you can pick a nice cover for hold it. Hold up, hold up. Uh, look at that goal in the background. <laughs> we should have shot free throws or something. <laughs> oh, 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 hold up. Don't mind us. We're just picking a good background. Yeah, absolutely. Promotion. There was one. You had your your hand on your chin. Oh, oh, oh fire. All right, that's good enough. You do this, make it make it creative, um, guys. Yeah, we're I mean, we're gonna probably go for a few more minutes, just kind of wrapping things up. And uh, one more thing that I did want to ask you, uh, Jaron, was the 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 artistic scene in Louisville, mm -hmm. whether it's music, comedy, drama, dance, or anything like. Mm -hmm. What's your take on it all? I think Louisville is getting to a significant space right now where um, we're really starting to open things up for ourselves. I think that uh, the 502 come up is real at this point. Yeah, absolutely. I think, that, I think that Bryson Taylor opened up a lot of different avenues for ourselves. I think Jack did a lot as well. Absolutely. And so I think that now that uh, people will have an understanding that's uh, truly really up to me. It really, it really is possible to make it out. You know what I mean? And I think now a lot of people, a lot of people more so now than ever, have been inspired to really try to work on something that they're passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I encourage people to do the same. And um, yeah, I love all of it, man. I think we have a lot of it. Uh, I think that um, I think that here very soon, uh, people are gonna see very, very, very soon that what we're capable of. You know, we're gonna really. Put I mean, they already are for sure. Louisville is super slept on creatively and mm -hmm. and and artistically, really. Um, I just think like. You know, so you think like the come up and getting out. You think it's smart to get out of Louisville? I mean, I, I think it is necessary at some point because if you're trying to uh, expand onto a global or or uh, national and level, the business uh, here is yeah, just not. It's just, I mean, like for example, with stand up comedy. You know what I mean? I can't, I can't expect to will become a famous comedian staying in Louisville the entire time. You know what what I mean? if you were a famous comedian in Louisville though? I mean, I think that's fine, but I think that as far as a national scale, I think yeah. that I could be the most famous. I could be King Dingaling in Louisville. You know what I mean? That doesn't mean that I'm going to become a, a famous person nationwide. That's you know your I mean? rap name. And that, but that's just for the simple fact that Louisville is not okay. that large of a Thanks. city. It's not that large of a platform. It's very different from being successful in New York City or being successful in Detroit or being successful in L.A. than versus being successful in Kentucky. You know what I mean? So I think yeah. now that um, I think that everyone has a shot of a great understanding of when it is that you need to expand or get to the next step. Like for example. Um, Jack, uh, 2K Baby Sage, you know, they had to understand that at some point I have to leave in order to really expand and do what it is that I want to do. Jack didn't want it to be famous in Kentucky. He wanted to be famous nationwide, globally, yeah. or, or even globally. So it's like, you know, um, I can't expect to do that in Kentucky, not in a place where most of the people here don't even listen to rap music. You know what I mean? Yeah. Most of the people here well, don't even have comedy clubs that they can go to. I mean, in Kentucky in general, not a lot of people listen to the, it's, it's This is a country state. People like, you got to think about Southeast Kentucky, so, it, parts of Kentucky outside of Lexington and Louisville. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. There's definitely not really Lexington's a, a market. Lexington's pretty country. Yeah, there's not even, honest. yeah, yeah, exactly. There's not even that much of a market here for it. And so, um, yeah, man, I just encourage people to just figure out when it is, what it is that you want to do. And if yep. Louisville's holding you back, man, go. Because for me, really, to be honest, it's a matter of just, 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 as soon as, you know, things get better for me financially, it'll be a lot easier for me to be able to try to make those certain moves, you know what I mean? But that is my next step at some point to try to make sure that I expand as you just get out of Louisville. Get out of Louisville, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my plan kind of right now is I'm going to stack, stack up some money and either move probably back to somewhere close to Nashville or mm -hmm. go to Atlanta, to be honest, like. I don't, I'm when quarantine's over sometime soon within the next two months I'm taking a trip down to Atlanta mm -hmm. and I'm just gonna kind of I don't really know what the living situation is like um, like in terms of rent but I know near the city it can be expensive but anyways that that's my goal because you know I can't live with my parents forever so. yeah no I'm definitely trying to um I'm definitely trying to go to New York sometime soon. Not to live out there. Well, actually, I have thought about living out in New York but I want to go out there to start to start doing some stand up comedy to a lot of their different venues just because um. 
I think that New York is a great place for like as far as like a marketability and like just like different opportunities as far as stand up comedy. New York is probably the best place to be for a, a stand up comedian. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I want to go out there and just like have some time to be able to go and um work on my craft. You know what I mean? I, I, I know I will have no problem at all being able to find shows out there just because like they have plenty of places where it's like it's for people who want to be comedians, it's for established comedians already, it's for famous comedians, you know what I mean? So like I would just have to be able to get in where I fit in there and like work on my craft, you know what I mean? But yeah, uh, yeah for me, I want to either try to go out there or like try to go out to Los Angeles and uh, have an opportunity to work out there. I've also thought about trying to move to Detroit or Houston or, or Baltimore, places that are a little bit more predominantly black so I can see how I have an opportunity to still... Um, Expand amongst my people first, yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, like, create a platform for myself with that. I think that's uh, important, especially if I'm going to places of that nature, because that, that's easier for me as far as creating my own opportunities, while New York and L.A. are better for me as far as taking advantage of the opportunities that are, that are given to me. You know what I mean? The, mm-hmm. the opportunities that I create for myself. But it's like, for me, I want to, yeah, if I were to go to, to, to Detroit or Baltimore, when I, it'd be more so of me being able to really like create my own platform versus me trying to build a platform off of the opportunities that other people give me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And another thing is I don't want to put myself in a box like, oh, I'm going to go to LA, New York, or New York, Nashville, or Atlanta. It's like, Maybe I'm gonna go someplace else. You might, and, and you might, it. you might go to Atlanta for two years and then yeah, decide you want to move. You know what I mean? Like that's what that's how I see it too. You know? Maybe um, I'll go to Canada. Okay, I probably won't go there. But um, <laughs> that'd be lit. Yeah, it's, it's just all about what it is that you feel like. You have to just be ever changing and ever and ever adaptable. You know what I mean? Like don't and get, and, and th- it just like take it as it comes, man. Like, yeah, just, and don't and, get too and, comfortable. Especially nowadays, like with I've just realized like me getting older and you know understanding a lot more things. It's like I think about like just like how quickly time has moved man yeah. we talk about high school was like Kevin, nine just, years ago just just a few years ago you were 23 and you were freshman in high school you remember that i was you were, 23 if yeah you, <laughs> you were oh, the oh, oldest oh. person that was in the class <laughs> this man kevin was driving his freshman year of high school <laughs> driving to school i was not 23 in freshman year i did turn 16 though he's had that facial hair since <laughs> since freshman year he was 16 his freshman year yeah i, I was driving in freshman year though but but yeah, no, time is definitely moving by fast. It's kind of, it's as you get fast. St- and I think that now, like, I think it's good now, though, because now we're all at the age where people now realize the importance of um, doing something. You know what I mean? Like, people are not trying to be lazy anymore. People realize, like, okay, now, like, like, being cool was fun in high school. Now it's like, either you're broke or you're yeah. not. You yeah, know yeah, no, I mean? even like, in, after college, it's like, wow, I really got to grind. Yeah, it's like, I mean, either, I started realizing that through college. I was like, man, all right, this, like, yeah, that's why I started making as many connections. Yeah. Make it's connections like now we're when the, you we're can, at the age man. where people are starting to realize like either I'm going to be successful or I'm going to be poor. Like, or, or I'm going to meet somewhere in the middle. But it's like, now like, it's really up to you. We can't, we're at the age now where we can't use our parents as an excuse how we used to be before. You know what I mean? Like, when you grow up and you're a poor kid, it's like, okay, when my parents are poor, there's not much I can do about that. Now it's up to you. Right. You know what I mean? Right. That's so, a good, that's. I mean, like, now I, I, I encourage people to really just try to get on their shit and really just, uh, you know, find something they're passionate about and go and go towards it. Yeah, the biggest thing I would say, guys, is make connections every day, especially right now just through social media when you've got the downtime. And I mean every day on social media, but like right now is social media has grown more than ever connecting yeah, people. Truly, and, truly. Mean, that, just, was, that was something that uh, Urban had told me too is the fact that like now we really have – if you want to have 300 million followers on, on Instagram, it's really up to you. You know what I mean? I mean it's up to people that follow you, but it's really about you having a platform – so, like, everyone has the same platform that you have. You know what I mean? Everyone does. Like, everyone has an Instagram or has a Facebook and whatnot. And some people that are doing more with that than others. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so you have to look at it as an opportunity where it's like, uh, there's always something more that I could be doing to, to, to help boast myself or improve myself or just give people something that they want to see more. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to think if there's any... Uh, I was going to ask you one more question about... Well, do you have any, any, okay, I was going to say, a starving comic in Louisville, what do they do first? They have, they have, they have a a small following on social media, and they're looking, they need, they're they're trying to do their first show. Okay, so so what I encourage is, one, um, work on your craft, write as much jokes as you possibly can. Um, really study a lot of comedians study uh, you have to look online and do research about like the difference between a good comedian and a bad one do different research about you know what type of c- comedy you want to do what type of person you want to be while you're on stage you know what I mean 
also I encourage you to network as much as possible. Mm-hmm. Who you know is Facts. very important. Yes. If I did not know if I did not know my friend Domdi and I did not host his show, I would not have met Jake, who's a promoter at Z Bar, I would not have the shows that I have right now. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's really about me knowing people. It's about you being able to connect with people. You have to be kind to everybody and so like make sure that like you have to be a social strategist in a lot of different ways. You know what I mean? You have to make create opportunities for yourself yep. with the people that you know. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And then from that, man, I just I just encourage you, uh, pay your dues. You know what I mean? Do those three minute, those five minute sets, and you see if, if, if comedy is even something you want to continue with. Some people think they're funny and they're not that funny. You know what I mean? Like, do it and, and, and take the heat that comes with it. See how well you do with it. You know what I mean? And then from there, just work on how can I get to the next step? How can I expand? How can I do what it is that I need to do to where I, I feel like I'm in a space where um, I can succeed with this as much as I possibly want to. You know what I mean? It's really up to you. But yeah, that's Absolutely. what I encourage everyone to do. Just, you know, go out there and um, just get a detailed plan of what it is that you need to do to get to the next step and just keep grinding. Put in all the work and effort that you need to. Yeah. Man, one thing that this producer, Illmind, was saying once is uh, he said that, you know, if you, relating it to music, because he's a producer, he was like, you know, if I'm spending all my time doing music, you know, eventually the universe is going to, like, respond to that. You know, like, you you put it, basically saying, put in the work and, you know. In order to put in, in order to put in 10,000 hours, you have to do eight hours a day for three and a half years. Yeah. And so you have to think about it like this. If anything you pick up, like you with music, Kevin, like how long have you been working on music? I mean, I've been making beats for like four years. For four, you know what I mean? But like, mm-hmm. it probably hasn't been not, eight not hours. hours a day. But no. the whole point is now you have an understanding of like to truly master something, it takes 10,000 hours. Right. And now that you have an understanding of that, you also, okay, I'm definitely not where I need to be yet, but I'm still on a great path to getting there. You yes, know what I'm saying? Yes. But it, it just takes That's, you understanding that you do have to apply more pressure or it's not your time yet. You know what I mean? Rounding it back out to what we were talking about earlier. That's <laughs> you do smooth. have to nice. apply more pressure or it's not your time. Exactly. Yet. And what do you think about overnight successes? Is that a thing or no? I mean, people say that they had an overnight success, but truthfully, it's, how many it's, how many people have really exactly. just made it's, one it's song? A perception thing. One song ever. Like, how many people have made one song? Like, I, I want to hop in the studio. I made one song and it was a Billboard Hot 100 and I'm just rich. Not many people. Not even not, not even Lil Nas X or anything. Mm-hmm. He had music that he was working on prior to that. Yeah. It takes you getting to a space where how do you improve? How do you get to the next level? And some people get there faster than what might, people might have thought they should or anything like. Even the baby, the baby was not an overnight success. If you look, if you look back, the baby had plenty of mixtapes where his mm-hmm. music was trash. <laughs> it was trash. I mean, but it most takes people's him, is when they start. Not but, everybody. Yeah, but, but it, it takes him growing and understanding how it is that he was actually ever changing and ever adaptable too. If you look at his music from before, he changed his music a lot. You know mm-hmm, what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's one thing that not a lot of people are comfortable doing because they get caught in this this comfortable space of, I mean, this is decent right now. I don't want to change. You know what I mean? Like you have to learn to be ever changing and ever adaptable. And so, like, yeah, like that. That's that overnight success. Shit, it doesn't work unless you're able to like. That doesn't even honestly always happen. You know what I mean? Like that happens so much rarely than what we think. Like people only think like they see what what really happened. Like people see Jacks what's popping, but they don't see Handsome Harlow or Eighteen or Gazebo or Confetti or they don't they don't see all of that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's the thing because not a lot of people knew they don't him even, like they yeah. knew him now. So they they're just like, the, oh, exactly. They don't see the YouTube freestyles see. that he put up before <laughs> or yeah. all the times that he was at school. For, they, they don't see any of that. You know what I mean? But all of that goes into play whenever you're talking about And like some people really might look at Jack right now as an overnight success. Yeah. You know what I mean? But that's not the case at all. It takes a hell of time, a hell of effort. And how can I get to the next step? You know what I mean? Absolutely. That's a good point. Mm-hmm. Man, well, Jerron, it has been a pleasure. Kevin. Your debut show, man. I'm, mm-hmm. Again, I, guys, I apologize for the technical difficulties. This Mostly this will be, starting out is going to be, except for today, of course, will be supposed to be over Zoom and, or FaceTime. You know, I'll have people, like, call in, and then we'll be you'll be seeing, like, their screen up there, too. But we're having I'm having technical difficulties with Zoom. So we'll, we'll hopefully get it figured out next week. Um, I'm working on my next guest for next week. It should be uh, – Let's see what's sat next Saturday. It's, the podcast should be the same time uh, next Saturday. Um, I'll let you know uh, within the week. You'll, I'll post some pictures of who my next guest is. And uh, for everybody that was in the live, uh, the Instagram live, I appreciate you. And in the uh, live chat, Julia and Mitch, I really appreciate y'all following the live stream on uh, uh, YouTube. That means a lot for real. Mm-hmm. Uh, this uh, video will be on the Lush Louisville uh, YouTube tonight. Uh, and then by next week, hopefully my I was having an issue with the Lush Louisville YouTube getting verified to stream. I, I 
it says it takes 24 hours. I did it like three days ago, and it's still not letting me. So hopefully next week we'll be streaming from the Lush Louisville YouTube page. But I appreciate y'all tuning in and sticking out, sticking it out with me. And uh, again, you know, this is a podcast to tap in with different creatives all over Louisville. Some that I know and some that I'm building connections with. So we'll see. You know, I'm trying. I'm thinking about. You know, I've got a little uh, connection with Russ Smith. Try and bring him on here. Uh, <laughs> John Wu. I don't know. He's a he's a legendary producer in Louisville and other a few others too. Um, but yeah, so just uh, stay tuned. And again, I really appreciate y'all. This the uh, debut show. Yes, yeah, sir. Shout out to you, Jerron. Yes, yeah, sir. Sir. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get you a file of you, and I'm gonna put that on the sound pad. And yeah, anytime sir, there's a gym, I'm just gonna yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> But all right, y'all, I appreciate y'all. Y'all be safe and uh, tune in next week.